Welcome to Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Rojas. Open Minds Radio is your UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. That is I, your host, Alejandro Rojas. Or this is I, that was Bob Dean. And thank you, Bob Dean. I've told him that several times, even though I don't think he listens to the show. But I told him that when he did it. But that's the wonderful Bob Dean lending us his very wise-sounding voice. To the intro of a magnificent radio show, and that is Open Minds Radio. We are your UFO news authority, and we have a great show today. Whitley Strieber. I used to say Strieber, but I was wrong. It is Strieber. And you all probably know that because he's a very popular uh, author, uh, author of the popular book Communion, which essentially brought the whole abduction phenomena forward to uh, the public. So we'll be talking to him a little bit about that, but we're going to mostly be talking to him about his new book called The Key, which is very interesting. This has to do with a situation in 1998 where he was out doing his uh, book tours for uh, the communion book And in the middle of the night, some guy comes to his door and knocks on the door and kind of freaks him out. He he wants to talk to him, and we'll talk about, you know, how this all came about and what he felt at the time. But it was kind of weird. And this guy then starts talking to him about, you know, humanity and, and all of this very deep, important stuff as if he was some sort of wise person from the ether. So from the unknown. And Whitley's website is Unknown Country, if you want to go there, a very popular website. So it's very interesting stuff. Uh, Whitley had self-published a book about this previously, a few years ago. But, you know, that didn't really sell too much copy, too many copies. You could only get it on his website. So now he's gone with a, a larger publisher, and now it's in the bookstores. It's packaged in a pretty book and everything. And it's very interesting. We were lucky enough to get a preview copy. I know uh, it actually went on sale the 12th. So that was Thursday, the day before Friday the 13th. So now this weekend, if you already didn't go out and get it, or maybe you wanted to wait and listen to the show and decide for yourself whether you should get it, it's a short, quick read. And it is very, very interesting, I would say. So this is going to be a great show. That's going to be a lot of fun. And speaking of a lot of fun and some great shows, uh, I wanted to say thanks to Mental Radio, mentalradio.net. And that's an interview I got to do this weekend with the famous Shadow Stevens. And I remember Shadow Stevens from uh, my childhood because he was on TV. He did like this radio, uh, like the top 40 TV show or something like that and he would do appearances on different shows because he had a really deep voice and much better than that you'd have to check out mentalradio.net and then you know he was a good looking guy um so he was like this leading man type of guy I'm like wow he should be on more TV shows because he's really cool so just a real cool guy and it was a lot of fun because they were definitely take this stuff uh not as serious they they have a lot more fun, uh, which isn't for everybody. Some people like the more serious type of stuff. But they have a lot of fun, and they kind of have some comedy bits that they put throughout it. Uh, but they're very positive, too. They want to make sure that everybody understands the future is positive and there's a positive outlook to all of this, including the May 21st end of the world predictions because that's, of course, everybody's talking about that. And they were, too. Although I don't think they put much credence in it either. So it was a lot of fun. Wanted to say thanks to them. And also the Bay Area MUFON too because did a presentation with them. And Michael is out doing. Michael Schrapp with Open Minds is out doing a presentation. But I'm not even sure where. He did one this weekend. He, he's very stealthy. Just like the subjects he likes to cover. A stealth bomb. He'll slide in and slide out. You know, you never see him. You might catch a glimpse of him when he goes out to lunch, but it real. <laughs> and that you don't even hear that. There's no sound. You just might catch a glimpse of him once in a while. Real stealthy little fella. 
so much research into stealth just uh, I guess it's really helped him understand the technology so much that he can use it even when he goes to lunch heads out to his car to lunch also we will be at a couple places that you can come see some of the stupor stars of ufology and open minds we're going to be at MUFON and that's going to be July 29th through the 31st at the MUFON Symposium in Irvine, California so just go to MUFON.com to check more about that they're going to have some cool speakers I know they're going to have Joe McMonagall they're going to have Story Musgrave an astronaut talking about his UFO sightings and hopefully we'll have some of these guys on uh, the radio show uh, here soon because uh, we're working with them on that so that's very exciting. We'll see you then. And then, of course, there's Roswell. And you will see Alejandro and Antonio in Roswell. We're going to have a table out there selling some magazines and stuff, including our Roswell edition, which is exciting because Don Schmidt and uh, Stan Friedman, who wrote articles in that issue, are going to be in the room with us. So you can go get their signature, and it'll be a lot of fun. I'm definitely looking forward to that. It's a, a festival of just craziness in Roswell. Not quite Las Vegas, but uh, it's silly. I'll tell you what, it's silly stuff going on out there. Speaking of silly stuff, we got a silly guy in here named Jason McClellan. But he he's very serious about this subject because he covers the news. And these are the UFO headlines in the conventional news. And he don't mess around. He tells it like it is. Welcome, Jason, and thank you for being here to share with us. Thank you for having me, Alejandro, and greetings, everyone. This is your Open Minds News Brief for Monday, May 16th, 2011. A picture of a UFO was taken last week by a photographer in Melrose, Scotland. The photographer, who asked to remain anonymous, supplied the UFO photo to the Border Telegraph. He described the object in the picture as moving pretty fast at around 45 degrees towards the sky, with a tail showing the direction. The Border Telegraph contacted both the Met Office, which is the UK's National Weather Service, and the Ministry of Defense to see if either group could shed any light on the UFO in question. The Met Office had no record of a weather balloon in the area, and the MOD declined to comment. And this story is like a lot of other stories with lights in the sky and um, people contact different groups to see if they, you know, like the FAA, here in the States and in organizations to see if they had certain things in the sky. And I thought it was weird with this story how they, they pointed out that the uh, the Met Office there, their National Weather Service, they were looking at weather balloons. Mm -hmm. And you look at this picture, it doesn't look like a weather balloon at all. It's like a fireball in the sky with a sort of tail, like a mm -hmm. comet or something in the sky. So a weather balloon seems kind of a weird thing to, to go after, but there are other things I think the National Weather Service could have told whoever was looking into this about something in the sky and not just a weather yeah. balloon while you're talking about this i kind of had an epiphany and Share sort it. of a prediction Share is it. that i don't think that these services faa the weather services um you know the these other organizations they're not going to be able to blow people off like they keep doing i don't think for too much longer i don't think people will take it uh, luckily, this subject, I think, is getting enough into the public and the forefront, and we have enough credible people talking about it, that that's going to have to be the first area to break. Because, come on, if I'm seeing something strange in the sky, and I'm calling the FAA um, to tell them about it, it's ridiculous that they wouldn't take it serious. I mean, because it could be a safety hazard. They need to either something's got to happen they got to say well we're going to forward this on to so and so or something i think that uh, there's going to have to be some sort of uh, change in that well you would certainly hope so but it's pretty shocking the responses that have been given mm -hmm. most of the time because there can be visible objects in the sky and you'll read reports of the faa saying oh well we don't show anything on our radar yeah well you can see something in the sky yeah it's even more alarming that it's not on your radar, but yeah, exactly. it's there, so what are you going to do? Yeah, well, fix your damn radar. <laughs> your radar's broken, pal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But especially, I mean, the weather service, what are they supposed to say? We don't see any clouds in the area, and there were no balloons. I mean, I don't know what they could say, but especially organizations that are there to maintain safety, especially for commercial airlines or whatever, they've got, 
It's ridiculous that they can just blow people off like that. Right. It's wrong. It is wrong. Mm-hmm. But at least, Negligence. you know, there are some official organizations who give an official word. Yeah. Whether or not they're just, you know, who knows? They're probably just blowing people off. Yeah, they kind of blow people off, but at least they're responding. I mean, you know, Gary, uh, the Barry Goldwater range, they responded to my And I was very surprised at that. Ago. I found that typically to be true, though. For the most part, if you contact them, they're going to blow you off, but they're going to at least give you some sort of answer. Form letter, some form answer. Which was kind of cool when I started doing this in Colorado example, because people do this. If you see a black helicopter uh, and next to a UFO, then call the Air Force bases around you, and it helped. I called all the Air Force bases the first time this happened in Colorado. They were able to tell me what kind of aircraft are, you know, say, well, we don't have helicopters, uh, or one base said, well, the only people doing those uh, routine flying around Blackhawks are the Air National Guard. So then you get to find out what kind of aircraft are in the, your area being flown by who, and then you could be more specific when you request next time. That's a good good skill you've learned there, my friend. Yeah. Excellent. We've got more UFO sightings. Yes. The Shropshire Star published an article last week about UFOs that were seen in the sky above Shropshire, England. A video accompanied the article showing a mysterious sort of orange light that was seen hovering in the sky on May 1st. A second light appears in the sky and hovers with the first light. The first light then begins to slowly drift across the sky and starts blinking. It then accelerates and disappears. A period of time passes, then the second light moves in a similar pattern as the first light before vanishing from sight. According to the Shropshire Star, Shrewsbury-based UFO Investigation and Research Unit didn't think the lights in the video are Chinese lanterns, and the unit has been unable to come up with an explanation for the strange lights. Mysterious lights in the sky are apparently common in that area, and... one comment I read uh, related to this video suggested that it could be hot air balloons. And it's been a while since I've seen hot air balloons in the night sky, but I, I can imagine they would be quite bright. But these lights in the video seem extremely brilliant. And um, the article mentioned that uh, the person who took this video said people in the area see these things on a sort of irregular basis, not, not something regular like airplanes or things like that. They also mm-hmm. mentioned that the, there was no sound from the objects and that people who see these things refer them to them as mini suns. That's how bright they are in the night sky. Wow. And it's kind of odd how they just hover um, motionless for a while and then start moving. That's something else we should do then. I mean, you guys don't have them as much. We had a hot air balloons a lot in Denver, but it's probably because it's so warm out here. Um, and the cold air is the better. That's why they usually launch in the very early mornings because the colder air is better for hot air balloons. And hot air balloons don't go very long without turning their big flame on. So they'll coast along with their flame, and then, you know, you can hear it uh, pretty loud. They turn on their big flame to keep altitude. And uh, I don't even think they go more than a, a minute or two without having to turn their flame on to keep the, the balloon heated up and aloft. So... We should videotape those to, to tell the difference, but I think it's pretty obvious, a hot air balloon. Plus, when they turn on their flame, uh, depending on where you are, you can then make out the balloon part. Right. And especially the designs and stuff. They definitely have a look to them, where these are just sort of bright balls. Mm-hmm. And hot air balloons, yes, you can see that the, the flames go on and stay on most of the time. But this, uh, these objects that were videotaped started blinking at one point. Mm-hmm. You know what we should do, the whole crew, is go to, just because it's fun more than anything, the hot air uh, the balloon fiesta in Albuquerque. It's the biggest international balloon fiesta. And they have a couple alien balloons out there. I've seen pictures of that, yeah. Yeah, I've got some pictures uh, somewhere. Well, my hard drive crashed. I probably don't have them anymore, but they're really cool. Well, I, I think it would certainly be worth it, um, mm-hmm. you know, to, to experiment with some video yeah. there. Because then they have different types of balloons, too. Like, a, there are different... Uh, there's another kind that's more rare, that's but it's more round, mm-hmm. and they have some races with those types, so we could take uh, pictures of more than just one. And again, it, it, with, with uh, regards to this video we just talked about... And they don't move fast. Right. You know, they don't take right. off in any direction fast. Well, with, with this video, um, 
you know, this group who looked into it said they ruled out Chinese lanterns. Mm -hmm. And with the Chinese lanterns you and I have exper experimented with, I, I would have to agree that the behavior was certainly not like typical Chinese lanterns. Mm -hmm. However, we have pointed out that in the UK and in other places, there are variations of Chinese lanterns. There isn't just one type of yeah. Chinese lanterns. Some that have enormous fuel cells that are very bright, stay up in the sky a long time. And then there's illegal ones, m ones that are homemade, like when people put gas, what they put a trash bag around a flare. Right, right. And, you know, with, with wind dangerous. currents, wind currents at different altitudes, moving in different directions, different speeds, things can get kind of crazy up in the sky. Yeah. But it seems weird that these two independent lights would be sort of close to each other mm -hmm. and not move exactly the same at the same time. Yeah but follow in a similar flight path. Yeah, it's kind it's a of strange point. behavior. It's a good video to watch. Mm -hmm. So we've got the link to that on our website, openminds.tv. It's good sighting. And let's see, I think we have, oh, this is another interesting video we'll talk about now. Uh, storms hit the Dallas-Fort Worth area of Texas last week. According to the Dallas-Fort Worth NBC affiliate, lightning blew an electrical substation east of downtown on Tuesday night, resulting in a chain reaction of un an, an undisclosed number of transformers blowing producing an eerie light show that was reportedly captured on video by a Fort Worth CPA and amateur photographer named Brian Luntzer from his 34th floor condo. The video shows hundreds of explosions varying in color. The Star-Telegram reported that more than 300 cloud-to-ground lightning strikes occurred in Fort Worth from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m., and at approximately 9 p.m., these events prompted calls to police by residents who were reporting, oh, this is interesting, they were reporting fireballs, both from the sky and on the ground. Hmm. And uh, Lunza re reported, or recorded his video between 9.30 and 10. And this is also interesting, Bob Ray Sanders, a columnist for the Star-Telegram, witnessed the event, and he stated, I've seen lightning strikes, and this was no lightning. He further described, I saw fire in the sky and on the ground. I saw 10 or 12 explosions. It was like someone was dropping bombs. Well, when you watch the video, it's extraordinary. I mean, these things light up so bright. I've been there to see, uh, and a couple times actually, to see Transformers blow up. Mm -hmm. And it is pretty spectacular. They're really bright. They blow up. Um, sparks fly. And you do see like these orbs. If, if you were like on the other side of a building to where one's blowing up, you would see maybe orbs flying across. But still, that I'm talking about just one. But in this video, you see tons of them going off like crazy back and forth. To be in that area would be kind of scary because these orange balls would be flying all over the place, let alone how the heck this started. And some of these explosions were so massive. These yeah. brilliant blue lights would light up the entire sky. And other things with this video, some people claim you can see lights in the sky at certain points, these different orbs in the sky. Um, those most likely are, are, are lens flare because they, they occur when a very bright explosion happens and it sort of follows the camera. It's timed so with the explosion too. You see the flares when a certain explosion is going and its intensity varies with the explosion. Right. So I'm not yeah, saying certainly that's flares. what it is, but that, that uh, would suggest that that's what it is. But there are some flares, yeah, I think yeah, for sure. Absolutely. But, you know, there have been people who suggest that, you know, this was some sort of military energy weapon testing and, and mm. various things like that. But the, the varying colors and how long this thing went on is crazy. It's, it's, it's a mind-blowing video to watch. Yeah. And some people who have seen the video on YouTube said, well, why didn't the media cover this? Well, they did. It was it was really only isolated to the local media, strangely, because this is one of the most incredible videos I've ever. I've never seen an explosion. It's a show great like video. This. It's like a great light show on the Fourth of July, but it's yeah. all these explosions on the ground. It's an amazing video. Yeah. I think it's incredible. All right, well, we'll move on to another story. UFO sightings are reportedly on the rise in Finland. That's according to YLE, a Finnish broadcasting company. Apparently, hundreds of UFOs are seen in the Finnish skies every year. A Finnish UFO researcher from the UFO Finland, or UFO Finland organization has been studying UFOs for 46 years, and he told YLE, a photo is not enough proof for him. He stated, we always need basic information about the pictures. The internet is full of mere images. And I thought this story in particular was, was sort of different from other citing reports that get covered by major media because they, a lot of them um, 
when they talk to photographers who took pictures or talk to people who who are researchers of UFOs or people who have followed UFOs, um, they talk to people who believe absolutely everything they see. Mm. And so the people they talk to come off as sounding gullible. Yeah. Whereas this person who has 46 years under his belt, they chose to print his comments about a photo doesn't mean anything. We yeah. need more information. Yeah, which is true, unfortunately. I mean, if you've taken a picture or something, you know what was there. That's great because you understand that you're telling the truth and everything. But really to... Um, present something as certainly uh, unusual or, or a real photo, you need information behind the photo. And right. that's why when we see these videos that are anonymously posted, it's kind of a waste because it may be a great video, but we don't know much about it. As opposed to when you have multiple witnesses who can give you information about that video. That's why I think that Turkish, famous Turkish UFO sighting is so important because there's multiple witnesses unrelated they don't know each other who had seen this thing and talked about all seeing the same thing uh, along with this great video that's the sort of situation you're looking for and, and certainly the the photos and videos that don't have any information accompanying them it doesn't mean they're any less true it doesn't mean they they're not they're yeah. not accurate they didn't happen but it certainly doesn't help prove anything yeah it doesn't help the media latch onto it it doesn't help others it doesn't there's no substantiating the image. It's right. just, it's there. And unless you were there and saw it, it means nothing. And unfortunately, as we keep seeing demonstrated Photoshop and these video programs, they, you can do anything these days. Well, maybe you can. Your skills are better than mine. But No, I can uh, I can put your head on Arnold Schwarzenegger's body, though. And can you? I'd really like to tough. see that. That's cool. Yeah. I can do a little smiley face. Yeah, that's good. All right. There's a new documentary about strange and controversial conspiracy theories that will debut at the end of this week on May 21st at the Retro Dome in San Jose, California. The film is called The Truth is Out There and was produced by Dean Hagelin, who is also the film's host. Hagelin was actually a guest on our radio show before. Yeah. Hagelin okay. is best known as Langley, one of the lone gunmen from the television series The X-Files. The documentary follows Hagelin as he travels the world interviewing conspiracy theorists who believe in everything from UFO abductions to secret 9-11 plots by the U.S. government. Yeah, it was the interview we have of him on our on our magazine, and I I don't know if we put it on the web. I think it's just on the magazine, but it's uh, well, and it's mostly all in our radio show. Right, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, because you know, being a, you would think, well, he's not a UFO researcher. What does he know? Well, now he is a re UFO researcher, but more than that. Just going around talking about X Files and being at these sci fi conferences and being the behind the scenes with the X Files, he's got so many incredible stories, some really interesting, great stories. Yeah. I'm excited for this uh, documentary. I am too. I watched the preview, the, the little trailer he's got on the website, and it actually looks pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a cool guy. And he, he is a great guy. The Jakarta Globe recently reported a new crop circle in Indone Indonesia. The circle apparently appeared three weeks ago, but Beta UFO, a UFO sightings investigation group in Indonesia, was just made aware of the crop circle on Sunday. The design was 90 meters long and 30 meters wide and consisted of two circles topped with hexagons. By the time Beta UFO reached the circle, the landowner had already cut down much of the circle. The group reportedly sent photos and samples from the crop circle to, to a university to determine if the crop circle was man-made or not. Hmm, it'd be interesting to see what they find. Although, interesting enough, a lot of the media and everything in uh, the area with the last crop circle were very skeptical. Yeah. So we'll see. I think even university, there was some quotes from university professors in the area who were very skeptical. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. This group, their, their first response was to send it to university. Yeah, that's great. Yep. yep. So hopefully we hear more about that one. Mm -hmm. And lastly... Good old uh, Gary McKinnon may lose his fight against being extradited to the United States. The 45-year-old Scottish computer hacker was charged by the U.S. with the biggest military computer hack of all time. After uh, he claims that he was looking for information about UFOs and extraterrestrials. And that was back in 2001, 2002 that he did that. And he's been fighting extradition ever since. And there were hopes that the upcoming visit to the U.K. by U.S. President Barack Obama would result in a breakthrough for Mc McKinnon's case. But according to the Daily Mail today... U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder vowed last week to take all necessary steps to extradite Gary. So 
we'll keep our fingers uh, continuing to to be crossed for him. But uh, you know, any any last hope he has is sort of dwindling. Yeah, the U.S. has stayed resolute the whole time that we're not letting up. We want to, even when Barack went out there and they asked him about it, he said, you know what, uh, I'm going to let my guys figure that out and they're going to do what's best. But essentially saying, you know, and uh, a lot of people took that, that quote do. as something positive, like, oh, good, he's yeah. going to figure out something that's best for Gary. But yeah, his point was that he's letting his guys handle it. And if his guys want him extradited, whatever his gonna, guys say, that's the best. Right. So. Yeah, unfortunately, the both sides, the U.S. is standing strong with their their uh, wanting to extradite him. But funny thing is, it's the U.K. is kind of being sneaky. They're kind of being swarmy over there. Where right. They're just kind of avoiding the issue. It's been nearly a year and a half now that they were supposed to come up with their final decision, mm -hmm. which is their final, 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 because we've already had a dozen final decisions. But yet another final decision, which they're avoiding. They're totally avoiding coming up with the decision because they know if they extradite him, people are going to be really upset. And interesting enough, though, I do know that there was uh, extradition, extradition from some other country where they denied it. They said, no, we're not going to do it. And uh, people were hoping that that set some precedent. That um, And they were saying that this is not a terrorist situation. This does not fit under the uh, agreement we made for extraditing, which is what the UK is saying now, too, that they did this under the impression that this was just going to be terrorist acts, not, you know, some dude smoking pot and, and hacking into government computers. This has been a long, long case with all sorts of back and forths, and mm -hmm. the poor guy just wants to get it resolved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm rooting for Gary Teo, you know. Yeah. I'm not afraid to say that. Come on. Well, this has prompted the UK to even reevaluate their whole extradition process yeah. because they, they don't think this is right. Right. So. Well, anyway, Alejandro, that is it for the news. Remember to check out these stories and more at openminds.tv, your source for UFO related news. I'm Jason McClellan, your Open Minds news correspondent, and you've been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. All right. Thank you, Jason. So, some good stuff, lots of interesting news. And lots of British news in the last week. Uh, a lot going on out there, and it's kind of cool that their news covers it. Because, of course, we have lots of stories, but when you think about their population compared to ours uh, and the number of news sources they have out there compared to us, you know, we've got a lot more. So per capita, they've got a lot going on, which is pretty exciting. Other exciting things are some of the stories that we have up on the web right now. One of them that got on Coast to Coast, and we thank Coast to Coast AM very much for posting this link. I always send them the links to some of our cool stories. And this one was something Antonio found. Yet again, he finds some cool stuff in his archives. He worked with a gentleman uh, who ran an organization called ICUFON, the International um, Center for UFO Studies, something like that. And uh, this was... a guy who came from Ru Russia, Komen von Kavinsky, and uh, did research. And one of the things that this guy did was video and film because he was a professional film guy. And in 1978, actually throughout the 70s, there was uh, some effort, and we've talked with this Antonio, with Antonio and on the show before, but that the UN was actually working on UFO type of stuff. And this was uh, sponsored by the Prime Minister of Granada, Sir Eric Gary, and there was actually a resolution that was made where uh, the member countries were supposed to send UFO information to the UN, uh, but they didn't. Some did, but not many, and so the UN wasn't able to enforce this or anything. But uh, it did happen, and there were things that you know went on there. And the history is important because people say, well, we need the UN to pick this up. Well, they tried in the past, and of course we need to understand our, our past in order to strive for a better future. But what Antonio was able to find was some rare film of those hearings. So you see... Uh, Heineck, J. Allen Heineck, who we've talked a lot about, who used to do investigating of UFOs for the Air Force, who really became one of the first 
civilian UFO investigators. He's there talking to the UN on the floor. You see Lieutenant Colonel Coyne, who had a, a UFO sighting. And then you see a press conference with Heinick, Jacques Vallée, who we've had on the show, and, and Coyne. And you see Sir uh, Eric Gary there. And also present was uh, Stanton Friedman, actually. But unfortunately, they didn't get him on this uh, bit of film. And then I know it, when you scan, you know, Luckman, Michael Luckman is, is in there. And we've talked about him a little bit here and there. And he was on the show also. But, uh, yeah, he's in this film, too. So I'm extremely excited about this film. And I think it's mostly really exciting for UFO research geeks like me because uh, you get to see some of your heroes in action on this film at the UN. So it was such an important event. Some people have complained that it doesn't have any music, but I thought, you know what? I don't think we need to put any Metallica or something in the background like they do on these YouTube videos. It's film. There was no sound during that period of time. Really, it's just archival footage that's really neat, um, which is documenting this incredible event that happened when the UN was really talking about UFOs. So you can read the story there. You can read a lot more about all that happened back there. But that's really cool. And of course, we've got our continuing segments on the Royals and UFOs. And we have another uh, segment there with some interesting stuff. So go check out the website. But now, let us go ahead because we've got about an hour left. And let's talk to Whitley Streber. I'm really excited about this interview. So let's go ahead and talk to Whitley. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Whitley. I'm excited to have you on the show for the first time. Well, I'm excited to be here for the first time. I'm all pumped <laughs> up and ready to roll. Cool. Well, uh, and I'm also excited about your book. I, I know uh, it had been out before, but I hadn't read it then. And then luckily I got a copy from the publisher and I guess one of the first things I'd like to ask you about, and one of the things that I wasn't expecting, was that especially in the beginning of the book, you go into a lot of different types of paranormal experiences that you've had. Yeah, in the in the key, yes. Well, I've I've had right. In, you know, Anne and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago. I'm working on a book which is coming out in January called What Is to Come that sort of reviews our whole life together and. We really have. You're right. I mean, it has been since we since I was a kid, and for Annie, since we met, uh, it has just been contingent. It's, it's the way I live. Mm -hmm. I, I, as to why, I'm afraid you might ask that question next, and my answer is I don't know. Yeah. But it, it's sure there, all right. Yeah. It's interesting because... Your answer of I don't know is typically the answer I get, you know, when you ask people who have had incredible experiences, why them, and they're like, I don't know. Well, one possibility is this. There was a very interesting project done by a, a Dr. Ken Ring back in the late 80s uh, that was published eventually as the Omega Project, where he compared uh, uh, the life experiences of close encounter witnesses, near-death experiencers, and a number of other, other people, types of people who have had so-called paranormal experiences. And he s discovered that there was a consistency among people who had close encounter experiences, and that was that they had trauma in their childhoods of various kinds. Could be sexual trauma, could be a great family tragedy, but something that kind of sh cracked the cosmic egg and made their whole world turn upside down. Uh, and those people are the ones who generally have close encounter experiences. And I don't think it's that they're chosen and we're chosen. I think that we notice, that mm. we see it, something that is absolutely part of human life. That was actually going to be my next question, if you felt that perhaps others were having experiences or, or these uh, energies or entities are around them, they just don't notice them. Well, like I you. think everybody is. Mm -hmm. I think I think it's part of being human. I, yeah. I think there's a large part of being human that we have decided to turn away from, and I think I know why. Mm -hmm. I think it's because we are here building something, and in order to build this, we need within ourselves. I mean, uh, in order to build it, we need spontaneity. We can't do it 
if we have a, a, a foreknowledge of our lives, because the energy won't be there. The mm-hmm. energy of self-discovery will not be there. I think what we're looking at is an aspect of being, of being human, if you will, that lives outside of space and time as we know it. And we are projected into the time stream in order to have these experiences that enable us to explore ourselves and to make the extraordinary journey toward who we really are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, one of the people who kind of answered that question, uh, I like the story of the astronaut um, who had said, you know, he liked to think of himself as uh, the top of the food chain, even if he had to lie to himself to believe that. Yeah, well, he was a, he's a sweetheart, but he hates the UFO stuff. And mm-hmm. he was very plain spoken to me about that. He just hates the UFO stuff. And he, he does for that reason. He said, I don't want the path to, be, to Mars to be well-worn. And you can't blame him. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're here for an adventure. And if we're <laughs> told, oh, well... You know, uh, you want to go. You, you want to go to another planet. There's a bus over there leaving in a couple minutes. Right. Uh, it's it's kind of depressing. Mm-hmm. You know, you 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 want it to be new and fresh and exciting and amazing, and somehow or another, thinking that there's somebody else above us in the food chain, that they know more and they are lo- kind of looking down on us, really rubs intellectuals and scientists the wrong way, and it's frightening. And I don't blame them. I. It doesn't bother me, God knows, uh, uh, but uh, it, it it does bother a lot of people. Yeah. Now, that also touches upon, of course, a lot of what was said uh, by the master of, of the key in the book and, and this idea of uh, this organ that we don't use, uh, meaning, you know, being able to see and communicate with uh, the other side. Yeah, this organ, that's a very important part of the key, because what he does is he explains not only what it is, but how to use it. And it, it's quite amazing, because if you learn, if you, if you actually meditate, you can learn to use it, and it works. It's really something. It, it uh, opens you, just, just, just the knowledge of what it is, is all you need. It doesn't, you don't have to dance around the room or do, mm-hmm. uh, do, do, jump through hoops or anything. Just to know it's there and to go quietly into yourself and to meditate. And then it, 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 you notice it's, it, that it is giving you all kinds of points of contact beyond yourself that you don't ordinarily have. And sometimes they can get really vivid because, you know, we're not the only ones using this method of communication. Uh, there are others who use it and much more I would even suspect there are others from what I've seen out there that use it uh, and, uh, in a way that's enhanced by technology. Because remember, the master of the key also said something else. He said, there is no supernatural. It's all nature, some of which you understand and some of which you don't. Mm-hmm. Back, back in 1750, people were laughing at the idea of meteors. Scientists were scorning anybody who thought meteors were stones falling out of the sky. Uh, and, 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 and look at what, what, the, what the ancient Romans would have made of radio. Mm-hmm. I mean, we really, you know, in other words, it's simply part of the science of the soul. And we haven't really gotten there yet because we have not come into open contact with what he calls conscious energy, which is us and is all around us. That's one interesting thing about the conversation is that the, the science aspect, along with the spiritual aspect, and extraordinary you know, statements such as that uh, this organ that can communicate uh, with the other side uh, could be, because you asked the question, a mechanical thing. And I got the impression, and uh, I wanted to ask you about this, that he was even alluding to that we might build that machine prior to us, you know, people in large amounts being able to access this information without a machine. Well, exactly. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I think others have built machines mm-hmm. that, that, that intensify this access because every once in a while, when I'm meditating like that, I will have a very, very vivid image, a, a televisual image, it's that vivid, mm-hmm. of something like once there was a, 
a, a woman dancing, hmm. uh, but she wasn't human. She was her skin was a different color, sort of a almost like cyanosis blue, and her forehead was was much larger than ours. And uh, and she was dancing, and she was obviously in some kind of a performance. And it just lasted a couple of minutes, but uh, a couple of seconds, maybe twenty seconds. And another time, I had a very, very rich, vivid vision of a big granite building about seven or eight stories tall with two wings on it. Behind it was a hillside uh, with yellow flowers on the hillside and little clouds whipping across the, through the blue sky. And I could even hear noises. Uh, if they weren't noises I could even describe, a sort of low um, war- rumbling noise and uh a sense of very busy activity somewhere nearby that I couldn't see. And that lasted long enough for me to actually look at the building and look at the doors, try to see if I could see anything in the windows, which were dark and I couldn't, uh, to look up the hill and into the sky. And it wasn't on this earth. It wasn't of this world. It was another world. I was seeing an image from another world. And uh, I think that what I was seeing was... I was picking up a snatch of 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 uh, some kind something produced by some sort of technology. This is also the reason that SETI went out of business because we never hear radio because that's not right. how they communicate. This mm-hmm. is how. Yeah, using uh, essentially, I think what he referred it to as uh, quantum communication, which is something I've heard scientists talking about. Well, actually, there's a laboratory in. Um, in uh, China, which is attempting to build a quantum communications device. And there has, a a few years ago, snatches of uh, Mozart's Jupiter Symphony were sent via a quantum communications device. And the way it works is this. You take two photons and you entangle them by bringing them together. Then you move them apart and whatever you do to one of them will happen to the other at the same time with no time lag whatsoever. It is outside of space-time, the, the, the connection between them, and it's not a connection we understand. But if you do that not with two photons, but with two trillion photons, then you can potentially, by affecting the, the information load of one group of these photons, you can cause the other group to bear the same information load and that information, photons are really small, so that information can actually be far, far richer than even than you can achieve with microwaves, which are much larger than photons. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, and it's th- this is a this is a communications method that is being actively worked on. I know of a lab in China, in the United States. Unfortunately, my guess is that it's all being impeded by classification, and that the work that's being done on it is in classified laboratories the tragedy of our age uh, because we'll always be behind because Mm -hmm. of our obsession with secrecy. But that's another story. In any case, yeah, this is a very real technology. And the other thing about it is you could apparently put one group of those photons on one side of the universe, one group on the other, and the the effect would be the same, instantaneous response. Uh, Now, here's the question. If you have to physically entangle them then move them apart, it's going to take a long time because you have to move them in a physical device. Mm -hmm. And that device presumably can't travel all that fast in the universe because the speed of light is slow compared to the size of the universe. Uh, So maybe there is another way to entangle photons. And maybe when the master of the key was describing how to come into contact with that electromagnetic organ on the surface of your body and how to uh, not how to participate in its what it's what it's experiencing with in superposition without concentrating on it in such a way that you cause it to go into position and to just be around you just maybe it could be that there is not a necessity to entangle anything because mm-hmm. after all at the big bang the whole universe was smaller than the head of a pin. Everything was entangled then and probably still is. We just have to know that in order to be able to make use of it. Yeah. 
It's exciting to think of, you know, some scientist in a lab who creates this quantum communication device, turns it on, and all of a sudden he's talking to uh, disembodied uh, souls and, and extraterrestrials, and that's like this communication device that gets to to all of the opens up this incredible amount of information and ability. Oh, oh yeah. It it opens a whole new world up. And that's what the key is actually about. It's about mm-hmm. opening up a new world, but not a mystical world. It's a physical world, a world mm-hmm. of a new kind of science. Because, you know, he goes he goes through a whole bunch of different scientific predictions and the man was very, very careful. This book people have I've gotten accusations, oh you wrote it yourself. <laughs> You can't. It's impossible. No one in 1998 or even in 2002 when it was published would ever have offered an opinion that a gas could be a form of computer memory. It mm-hmm. would not, never. Who would think that? It was, when I heard him say it, I thought it was stupid. <laughs> and when I, I thought, when I was transcribing it, I thought to myself, that's something you don't want to put in there because it's like something out of the contactee culture of the 50s, a really, really stupid pseudoscience. Uh But as I point out in the new introduction to the key, it's now established reality. Yes, you can. All right. So, and I guess uh, let's get back to that. I was so, you know, excited and we'll get, we'll talk more about what he had said, but I was so excited about getting into some of those things. I guess I, there are the questions about, uh, the experience that you had. So, you know, you're, it's the middle of the night, and this guy comes to your hotel room. Um, what did you think at first, you know, when you opened the door and you, you see this guy? Well, not much. I, I didn't realize how long I'd been asleep. I thought I'd had dinner about maybe 10 mm-hmm. and in the room, and so the tray was still there. And I had, I was, I, might, I believe I was still, I, mean, I guess I was already in my pajamas. So I had, I had undressed, and, and I was in my pajamas, and they were just lying kind of on the top of the bed. I wasn't in the bed or anything. And there came a knock at the door, just a tap, 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 very polite, like a room service waiter would knock. And that's what I thought it was. So I went to the door, and I was just, you know, opened the door. I didn't ever occur to me that it would be anyone except a room service waiter, because who knew I was there? Mm-hmm. The publicist knew, and maybe a couple other people at the publishing company knew I was in the hotel even, let alone none of them would know which room. No, no one had needed to know that. You know, if they, right. so uh, it, it would have been one thing if he'd phoned, but, but it was an entirely different thing to knock on the door. So I just assumed, yes, room service. I opened the door, and this guy comes in. Now, at that point, I realize it's late. I didn't have my watch on, but I could sense that it was really late. And it, later, I, when I looked at my watch, it was almost, uh, it was after 2 anyway, for sure, around 3, as I recall. And, uh, you know, there's a rule of thumb in the in the semi celebrity world of writers, mm-hmm. where you know if you're, you, 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 in fact, probably even more so in the real big time celebrity world, you don't want to interact with anyone after midnight because mm-hmm. anyone who comes to talk to you after midnight is almost always going to be bad news. So my initial response was to get him out of there. I I wanted to get rid of him. I didn't I didn't know what to make of him, and then but then he started talking, and that changed everything after. 30 seconds or so, uh-huh. it was awesome. Uh, in his appearance, you know, uh, did he seem to be, uh, I guess, was he dressed well, and what is his age area seemed to be? Yes, yeah, dressed perfectly normally in, I believe, charcoal slacks and a gray tur- dark gray turtleneck, and uh, it's a turtleneck sweater, and uh, he looked to be in his 70s somewhere. He was not an... He, he didn't. He wasn't big, you know. He wasn't like a big Hulk, a bruiser, or anything. He was. I would say he was on the light side physically. Mm-hmm. He didn't look at all threatening. I, I right. mean, I could have definitely taken the guy, no question <laughs> in my mind, unless he had, you know, uh, some advanced uh, holds or something. There's no uh-huh. question. If we'd gotten physical, I could have definitely gotten him out of there. Yeah. No, I didn't. I didn't feel at all intimidated by him. And he was, he was a real sweet looking guy. He was an older mm-hmm. guy, and he. Uh, uh, rather pale, uh, but not unusually so. I mean, you could definitely, uh, if you walked past him in the street or sat in a bus or even interacted with him extensively, you'd never know there was anything unusual about him. 
Uh, he spoke quite quickly, and he seemed terribly happy. That was the thing that struck me. The man was happy. Mm-hmm. He so, was real, real happy. Is that what won you over? I mean, uh, how I, I, the conversation that you have kind of starts uh, where it seems like you already have the impression that he's a, a wise person um, when you ask why he's, he's there. Well, um, I didn't. I didn't put any of the BS of "Hey, wait a minute, who are you?" and all that stuff uh-huh. that, that went on right before I, the conversation. Because what's the point? Everyone knows what went on. I probably cursed at him. I mean, I, I wasn't violent, but I <laughs> right. I certainly was uh, certainly was making it very clear I wanted him out of there. Yeah. How do you win you over? Well, uh, first he said, uh, "You're changed." I, I asked him why you're here. When he mm-hmm. stood there. He stood there looking at me. He wasn't leaving, obviously. I was going to have to physically throw him out. And I said, why are you here? And he said, "Uh, you're chained to the ground. And I thought, what in the hell does that mean? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I said, excuse me. And then he said, I'm here on behalf of the good. Please give me some time. And when he said, please give me some time, there was something of an urgency in that, those words. And that that meant to me I was going to give him another couple of minutes for sure. Mm-hmm. And I guess the thing, you know, he said a few other things, but the, I guess the thing that got me was the thing that he said about the Holocaust, that we are not able to leave Earth because we do not understand gravity. And we don't understand gravity because a child who would have been born of parents who died in the Holocaust was not born. And therefore, we are trapped on earth. And that, I had never heard anything like that before. And that surprised me. That meant, basically, he had my attention from then on. Yeah, that was an interesting concept. I got from it, you know, what you said, and also he kind of alluded to other intelligent people, that we killed too many smart people. And uh, now we're stuck. we, we, we killed too many smart people. And, you know, uh, 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 oh, God, I got in so much trouble after the key first came out when these places like the Jeff Rents show and stuff discovered mm. that there was some pro-Jewish sentiment in it, which, I mean, I guess it is pro-Jewish. I didn't think of it that way myself. But, boy, I mean, there are a lot of people who who don't like that idea. Yeah, it's interesting, these people who are adamant against uh, the idea that the Holocaust happened when uh, that's an I don't understand that that concept personally. No, I don't either. I think it's it's deeply evil. I think it's profound evil. It's evil incarnate. You see evil in its raw form when you see people claiming that the protocols of the elders of Zion are real or claiming that the Holocaust never happened, any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we have to face the fact that I didn't do it and you didn't do it. None of our listeners did it, but it happened. And this, the fact that we're still here isn't, this, isn't a kind of punishment at all. I mean, he doesn't think of it that way at all. Right. We're still here because this happened. It's not our fault. It's just the reality of the situation. And they also, a lot of people get married, why should we be punished for the Holocaust? We're not being punished. Mm-hmm. It's, just na- it's just nature. Nature. Yeah. You know, we didn't get this, this guy, didn't, this child didn't get born, therefore we'll sti- we're, we're still here. Maybe sooner or later another child will be born or someone will figure gravity out. Because until we do that, we are here. Mm-hmm. Rockets aren't going to cut it. Right. Yeah, he gets into, um, well, he gets into a lot of like, because uh, you had asked him some questions similar to that about guilt and uh, feeling guilty and how do we uh, shed that. And he, he, like you had said, you know, all these things are part of nature. Uh, you just have to forgive and move on, um, which is pretty profound. I mean, statements like that, how much of an effect did this conversation have on you? Did it re- did it change the way you think? Oh, it changed my whole life. Mm-hmm. It rocked me to the core. Yeah. Rocked me to the core. Absolutely rocked me to the core. Uh, I was uh, completely taken by it. Mm-hmm. I was flabbergasted. The thing is, got, there's so many new ideas I think practically everything I've written since that conversation in 1998 has had, in some way or another, connect, a connection to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the book Superstorm came out of that conversation, then became the movie The Day After Tomorrow. 
uh, I don't think the Grays came out of it, but, uh, but uh, other things certainly did. Uh, other books certainly did. The latest one, Hybrids, comes right out of this conversation because I had the eeriest and the most wonderful exchange with him about intelligent machines. It was remarkable. And if this is because what made it so remarkable, this is a man who's had experience with intelligent machines. He knows what they are. He lives with them, obviously. And my wife thinks he's from the future. He, she says to me, it's you from the future. And, hmm. I, you know, I'm now about maybe 10 years younger than he was. So I've got a lot of living to do if I'm going to come back to myself in 1998 <laughs> from uh, uh, 20, uh, uh, 2020. But I don't know if that's true or not. I, I, I have well, no idea. Said- and that was kind of an interesting statement when you asked, come on, who are you? You know, you're a real person, I'm sure, or, or, or not. And he said he was Canadian. Yeah, but he didn't pay taxes. Not a single Canadian who has talked to me about this book has failed to notice that, because if you're Canadian, <laughs> you're going to pay taxes. Uh huh. But not necessarily, and I'll tell you why. There are native tribes in Canada who do not pay taxes. Hmm. The Mi'kmaq Indians are one of them. And the Mi'kmaqs have a very European look to them, and they might have been, they might, it might be that John Sinclair, the, the uh, Templar leader, who came, apparently came in the 13th century to Newfoundland with a group of Templar exiles from Europe after the burning of Jacques de Molay, uh, settled there and interbred with those Indians, which is why so many of them have a very European look to them now. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's what he was. Yeah. Maybe that's what he was. And I tried to find out. And I'll tell you this: I did find out one thing. That tribe's got a lot of secrets. It's they have deep, profound secrets and knowledge that they do not share with outsiders. Mm-hmm. I also went into the Templar community in 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 uh, C- Canada, which is a very living part of Masonry in Canada, uh, and. I I never actually met the Master of the Key again, but I wouldn't be surprised if I hadn't talked to people who knew him. I didn't think he was an angel or anything. He seemed too totally human to me. I, it was a guy, mm-hmm. hopefully from this planet, hopefully right. from this time. I don't know. Maybe he was from the future. I don't know. Well, and, you know, speaking of secrecy and, you know, the, the, these tribes with their secrets, uh, it's something you talked to him also, and, and something that you said you were even angered by, something you, you obviously were not happy with uh, when you spoke with him, was the secrecy, for instance, with the uh, entities. You know, of course, you're well known for your abduction experiences, them not coming forward and others not coming forward uh, with the information that they're here or the information that they have to the general public. And uh, he kind of spoke to that Uh was he able to alleviate some of that frustration for you, or do you still have it? I think we're in an end game scenario here. I think that our world, our, our, its ability to support us, is disintegrating around our ears, and I am frantic for something to help us in some way. Mm-hmm. Because believe you me, in fact, if the high Arctic is as hot next summer, this coming summer in July and August and September, as it was last summer methane outgassing in that area of the world is going to become completely go completely out of control and that is going to derange our climate even more profoundly and very dangerously and i i just am worried sick frankly uh i think that, that i wish he had given me a lot more practical information but he gave me so much and yet you know how many people read the key when it was available on my website about 2000 people Mm-hmm. How many people will read the key once it's out? Oh, maybe another 20,000 in the, in the bookstores if people pick up on it and tell their friends, which they may or may not do. But basically what you find out when you're in a situation like I'm in of knowing a lot more about what's happening to us than most people do is two things. First, people are going to be in denial. They are going to not believe you until after it happens. And second, those who aren't in denial, 99% of them are completely passive. They are inert. They don't do anything. They simply engage in their daily lives until they can't do that anymore. And it becomes very frightening. 
the number of people who are active in this world is minute. And the number of active intellectually and uh, politically, et cetera, active people who would entertain these ideas or think that it would even be worth opening a book like The Key is infinitesimal. So I think whatever nature has in store for us is what's going to happen. And that's why I'm scared. Yeah. And, you know, you brought that up in your book, and, and it's something I've thought about, too, is that, uh, you know, is the mess we're in completely of, of our making humans? And if not, does that justify then uh, a third party coming in and helping us? Because, you know, when you think of, like, the, the prime directive or, you know, not to get involved in, in something, uh, obviously something we're being interacted with, and does that justify us getting help? And I'm like you, I hope so, and do you yeah. think that we are being helped at all? Well, I, I know we are, mm-hmm. and I, I, I can tell you precisely how, because, you know, my wife is a science editor, and a really, really good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, she edits unknowncountry.com, and she does a lot of other things in that area, and she discovered a paper which indicated that when people are challenged with questions they can't answer, for example, if they see the surreal work of someone like Franz Kafka, or if they are challenged by something like the UFO enigma, the brain actually responds organically, and they become smarter. They become more logical. And uh, this is happening to people all over the world. The whole UFO phenomenon, the mysterious crop circles, the enigmatic cattle mutilations, the lights in the sky, the seeming threat that never really evolves into anything of abductions, all of that brings up a question that we cannot answer and that we cannot let go, and that actually changes physically the brain. Everybody who is addressing this in any way whatsoever is getting smarter. Now, that's awesome. And so certainly somebody is helping us, but you can see here, they're helping us in a very, very passive way. They're not actually coming out and, and trying to change the, 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 the flow of the river of human fate, as it were. And whether or not they would do that or even be able to, I don't know. Uh, I do know that back in the 50s, we shot at him. <laughs> and uh, I know that because Dr. Milton Torres, uh, his, his uh, experience that he had uh, as a pilot over Surrey in 1957, when he was actually ordered to shoot at a UFO, was remained completely classified for years. And then it, it came out, it was released by the British Ministry of Defense, and Dr. Torres came forward and said, yes, uh, it happened. I was ordered to shoot down a UFO, and I did go up there. I was getting ready to fire my rockets at it, and I didn't fire them because it disappeared before my eyes. I disappeared off of radar, rather. And uh, so uh, when, you know, they're in the Indian Ocean during the tsunami, there's a little island in that ocean that is protected by the Indian government. No one is allowed near it. And the reason is that there is a tribe on that island who never sees anybody. They've never had any interaction with anyone, not in thousands of years probably, hundreds or thousands of years. So when the tsunami came, the government was concerned about them and wanted to see if they needed help. So it sent a helicopter to fly around their island. And the, as the helicopter flew around their island, here they came running out onto the beach with their shields and their spears, shaking their spears and firing mm-hmm. arrows at the helicopter. And I thought, oh, how sweet. Right. Oh, you know, it's breaking my heart to see these innocent people. And I thought, the whole planet looks like that to the visitors. Mm-hmm. And no, I don't think they can land because I don't think there's room for them here yet. We're too crazy right now. We need yeah. to calm down. And the best people, the people who can really do this, uh, who God knows who they are, I mean, uh, those of us who at least – wouldn't shoot back. Need to be the ones that are that are on the on 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 the front line. But that's not going to be the way it happens. If the visitors showed up, you can be sure that there would be Navy SEALs, waves of helicopters, armed to the teeth, if they landed. What right. Are they, what are they going to do about that? Nothing. Mm-hmm. Just leave again. Yep. Or do like. You know, it kind of alludes to the the abduction thing. For instance, if we wanted to help those people on the island, we might have to shoot them with tranquilizers and take them off the island when they're out. Uh, 
Well, that's true. And also, if you thought that they were going to go extinct, you might yeah. take sexual material and DNA and right. things from them in order to reconstitute the species somewhere else. Mm-hmm. You could any All of this stuff works in a kind of basic way. It all makes a kind of sense if you look at it the right way. On the one hand, on the other hand, I don't even know what the visitors are. I can't tell you they're from another planet. They never mm-hmm. said anything like about that to me, any of them. And certainly the master of the key, if he was from another planet, they speak excellent English. Right. And, you know, that, that brings me to, you know, uh, John Mack, for instance, and some of these others. Uh, I, I feel I've, I've seen evidence that, um, you know, at least some of these experiences are very physical but with your experiences, do you believe, because, of course, John Mack felt um, these experiences were non-physical. Um, yeah, J- John and I talked a lot about that because I'm in another completely different camp there. Mm-hmm. I got raped on the night of December the 26th, 1985. And, you know, it was so harsh that I still have to be treated for it. I was treated for it about six weeks ago mm-hmm. uh, because of the damage that was done in t- to my body. And, you know, that that's... That's not a, an imaginary experience. Right. I didn't have a bad dream. You don't have a bad dream that lasts 30 years. Uh, another thing, in, the, in May of 1989, uh, an implant was put into my left ear, which is still there. It's still there because it was so technologically advanced that the doctor who tried to take it out was unable to do so because it moved down into the bottom of my earlobe absolutely under its own power. And it, he closed the wound because uh, the suture, the incision, because he couldn't uh, possibly get it at that point. And once the incision was closed, three days later, the thing went back up, and I left it there because I didn't know whether it was for its safety or my safety or both of our safeties that it had eluded capture. Mm-hmm. But it was put in by people, two people. I saw them. I wasn't, a, I wasn't asleep when they came into the room. They came right into the bedroom in the middle of the night. They incapacitated me, but I saw perfectly clearly before they came. It was a man and a woman, and there was something behind them. I've never really, I didn't see that, but there was something or someone else behind them. And they were outside, too, because as I woke up, I heard a voice in the backyard say, Condition Red. Uh, and uh, then I heard them all running away. And Yeah. So it's, all, it's quite physical at times. Does that mean that it's basically a physical event that is that is being confused by a lot of non-physical effects? Or is a fundamentally non-physical event that can sometimes penetrate into the physical? I don't know. <laughs> right. And it's interesting you talk about the enigmatic, which, you know, of course your experiences are and many are, because I just wrote something about... I've always felt the trickster and the Native American stories that I, I grew up with uh, were representative of a very similar and enigmatic nature for that purpose, to humble us and, and make us grow. And I and amongst seasoned researchers in this field, uh, that idea comes up over and over and over again uh, to colleagues that I speak with. So I wrote about that, and it's an interesting aspect, and I didn't know that it's been proven that dealing with enigmatic uh, issues uh, makes you smarter. Yeah, but it has. Uh-huh. It certainly does. And That's so great. It's, it's working for you, uh, probably. It's just working for all of us, yeah. the whole field. We're going to end up a bunch of geniuses and then figure out, great. we'll figure out how gravity works, and we'll get the hell out of here just in time. <laughs> yeah, I hopefully hope so. we can. Yeah, I hope so, too. We don't have too much time. It's kind of scary. No, now, we don't have much time left at all, no. What would you estimate? If the methane uh, hydrates under the Arctic Ocean start outgassing, then that's the end game. That, mm-hmm. the, if they start, if you start hearing reports that the that the uh, high Arctic Ocean is like carbonated water some summer, it's it's bubbling and fizzing. That's methane, and yeah. then we're going to go into a uh, cataclysmic climate event, uh, very much like the one I, that the master of the key describes. Because mm-hmm. remember. Uh, every we we don't want to feel defenseless and helpless, so no one will say the truth, and that is that has now been amply proved in by science that climate change takes place sometimes as in as quickly as thirty days and stays in a new phase for hundreds or thousands of years and uh, that we could be up against that, and if we are, then uh, I can tell you precisely what's going to happen. What is now the breadbasket of the world, the middle Canada and the middle United States 
going to experience a protracted drought. And when that happens, basically the world will starve. Basically. Uh, that some of the, some co- will be the last to go. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. us and the Canadians, but the rest of the world has really got a problem. Europe's a huge problem. Uh, mm-hmm. China, Russia, they're all, India, the Middle East, they're all fantastically vulnerable. And it could happen in a single season. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty scary. I've, I've seen uh, shows on the methane and how if if that were to happen, then the boats that were over these pockets would sink and the methane gas itself is poisonous. So it's a very scary scenario. It's a very scary scenario, and it happens. It has mm-hmm. happened in the past. It is the climax of every single interglacial. And this is another thing. The uh, environmental community is so bent on saying it's all our fault, and then that makes the the conservatives, the corporate community, say none of it's our fault. Mm-hmm. But the truth is right in between. This is a natural event. It is a we are moving out of an interglacial into another glacial phase. No one understands quite why that happens, but it does happen. And we have sped up the process by emitting so much carbon dioxide human beings have that's that's what we actually have done and i'm not so sure that pointing fingers really makes any difference right you know i just don't see it i see it as a natural phenomenon that we should have planned for mm-hmm. rather than gone and and sniping at each other about who's doing who's to blame we right. wasted a whole generation on that, when we yeah. should have been planning carefully for this event. Which we're still not really actively doing much about. Not at all. Mm. Not at all. Uh, we're not planning for it in any significant way whatsoever. It's going to happen. Whatever is going to happen will happen. The die has already been cast. There's no sense in worrying about planning for it and thinking to yourself, oh, somebody's got to get do something about this. It's too late. It's going to happen the way it's going to happen. And it, there's a very complex interaction taking place right now between Earth and Sun, and in fact the whole solar system, that we don't fully understand. Because if you've noticed, it's been much colder and much hotter here on Earth in the past couple of years. And weather uh, weather is extremely violent and, uh, and and very changeable. And we don't know quite why. We don't know quite why it was so much colder this winter than anyone predicted. Uh, it's not part of the global warming models, absolutely not. Of course, now they say that it is, but if you'd asked them last last summer, they mm-hmm. would have said no. Uh, the, uh, we, but we do know this. We do know that for the past 2.8 million years, every 100,000 years or so, this planet has moved from a, a cycle of uh, warmth that lasts 10 or 15,000 years to a long cold spell. And at the period when the changeover takes place, carbon dioxide spikes, as it is doing, methane spikes even more, and then when the methane boils off because it's a short-lived gas, it doesn't last like carbon dioxide, suddenly, during that time when they're spiking, apparently something is happening to the sun, and when the methane is gone, uh, it turns out there's not enough solar heat and the whole place turns into an ice, it goes, it turns into ice. You know, it might be that what we're seeing here is our star is getting old, and we are the children of an old, old mother. Yeah. Now, moving to a different subject, one that I wanted to bring up, the Master of the Key was very uh, critical of the United States in particular. Um, quite a lot about uh, how had they... Yeah, what an evil empire we've been, especially since the 50s. Yeah, well, uh, he sure was, and he was right about that mm-hmm. uh, in the sense that uh, uh, he was what he was he was so concerned about was the way this secret secrecy destroys the, the the chance of the soul to grow, and he 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 felt he said that their their secrecy stops. With, where the republic starts, uh, I mean secrecy. The republic stops where secrecy starts, or words mm-hmm. to that effect, somewhere in there. And uh, he uh, uh, he is uh, he is very critical because a lot of things have happened here that have been wrong. 
Mm-hmm. This country has been on a it has been sitting astride the world for a long time now, and we've made a lot of mistakes, and those mistakes are going to come home to roost. But at the same time, there's a there is a willingness to address the potential of the human spirit here, which is very far from uh, the negative uh, attitudes that he has towards uh, the various governments that we have created. Very, very different. So, and that is, uh, you know, there's a lot about uh, being able to, uh, the whole idea of of evolution and us, uh, what we can do to move on. But uh, what would you say, have you learned um, what people can do to um, help mitigate some of uh, these scary things we're looking at? Well, you know, that gets into the whole survivalist thing. You know, I got I to gotta buy uh, hundreds of pounds of peas and stuff. And this is too big. This is too big. It's going to affect us all in however way it happens to. There isn't any amelioration possible anymore. Uh, we're, beyond, we're past that stage. That mm-hmm. was true in the 1980s and even in the 1990s, but we didn't do it. Now it's too late. It's going to just happen the way it happens. So maybe the advice you can take from the masters to cultivate your soul so you're ready for your next adventure. Well, I think that's very clear that mankind is being born. Uh, the age, the water, age of Aquarius, everyone was, oh, wonderful age of peace and well, not so true. The water carrier pours the water out, and we're the little fish that has been swimming in the water. We're the little fish of Pisces that's been swimming in the river of the of the world for these last 2,000 years. Now the river's drying up. And mm-hmm. Look at it. Look at Texas. Look at the look at Brazil. Uh, the, the the these these places are in maybe not Texas, but certainly the Mato Grosso. Uh, the Brazilian rainforest is in a climactic drought. Mm-hmm. This is that is to say a drought that isn't going to be broken, and that whole forest is going to disappear. And with it, one of the great oxygenating engines and carbon dioxide absorbing engines on this planet. And that is not that is going to happen. It is in fact happening now. Uh, so, but what's happening is on an astrological level, uh, the the waters are being poured out, and the little fish with them, and the little fish ends up on dry land. That's us. Mm-hmm. But we have gills and flippers. We're not equipped to swim or to do anything on dry land except dry out and die. But this is a big, old, complicated universe, and that ain't the whole story, I can assure you. So are you... Do you feel in our, in your lifetime then, and in the, or possibly in the next few years, um, prior to perhaps all of the the, the real bad cataclysmic um, events, that we will be able to uh, more in mass um, interact with uh, some of these uh, entities on the other side? Well, I, we're interacting with them plenty right now. Uh, mm-hmm. You should go to my website and. I mean, uh, it's not actually visible on the website, but people send us close encounter experiences about close encounters every single day. Mm-hmm. Uh, we get we get, probably get fifty a week, and these are usually things that have just happened to me last night, last yesterday, happened to my husband over the weekend. It's happening right now. Uh, we are involved, and in whoever or whatever they are, they're here now doing their thing. It hasn't it hasn't abated at all. But people have learned that it's dangerous to 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 tell friends or to tell anyone so they have an outlet they put it up on our on our site and they can do that anonymously mm-hmm. and so they have at least someone to tell and uh so as soon as that became clear uh that they started in again you know i thought back before we changed unknown country into a new type of website we redesigned it i thought maybe the close encounter experiences are sort of dying out but they're not at all What's the, the um, amount of social opprobrium that's associated with them has grown. Mm-hmm. You can't say that this happened to you around work and expect to be remain there for very long. Right. If you if you tell people uh, friends, those friends are going to be laughing at you for the rest of your life. 
if you tell family, you're going to have likely to have quite a bit of trouble. And if mm-hmm. you're, in, should God forbid, end up in a divorce situation, and you've told your husband or wife about your close encounter experiences, you can expect you ain't going to get the kids. Mm-hmm. So, people right. are circumspect. Now, when it comes to these people uh, having different uh, accounts, um, you know, people that seem to uh, believe that they're communicating with uh, some of these things. Uh, all of the messages, there's kind of a similar line, but there 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 are big differences. How do you account for the differences in, in the stories or the communications? Well, first of all, whatever is out there or in here is incredibly complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, so many different ma- ways of manifesting its reality. It's very complicated. It's very brilliant. And we are, too. I mean, we're very brilliant and we're very complicated. And so you're going to get a whole lot of different, every time that interaction takes place, it's going to be different. The fact, you know, people, they used to make a big deal. Oh, they're all seeing the same uniforms, the same belt buckles. It's scientists from another planet. I'm sorry, this is just way, way different from that. Uh, People have all kinds of interactions at all different levels in this thing. Uh, And there's a matrix that they follow, certainly. Uh, but uh, but it's only it's only a very general matrix. It doesn't. It's not nearly as focused down as some of the UFO people would like us to believe. It's mm-hmm. very much unfocused, and you see all kinds of different things. All kinds of different things. Yeah. So your website is unknown country, and I noticed in the book, you know, uh, one of the the lines that you were even uh, kind of had an effect uh, on you from the master of the key was um, talking about how the backyard your backyard could be your undiscovered country. Um, did you take that line? Did you modify that for your website? Uh, I don't think I did. I, I think uh-huh. that line, I don't know where exactly what you're talking about, but that line is in there uh, that you make the undiscovered country your own backyard. Right. And, you know, he was he was incredibly hopeful. He was no wonder the man was happy. He was really mm-hmm. hopeful. He was very hopeful. Yeah. Uh, and uh he you know i tried to tried to needle him and stuff and uh, i'm always like that i used to try to make the grays mad to see what would happen and uh, it, it isn't something you would want to do because what <laughs> they do get mad and it turns out they still don't have to try they get mad anyway um uh, they're easily pissed off uh but you know i you know we're getting close to the end of this, and I'd just like to bring something up myself. Okay, great. Because I think it's terribly, terribly important. He said one thing that I think has I have carried with me literally every moment of my life since I heard it. I asked him what sin was, and he said, denial of the right to thrive. I think that is the finest, most illuminating most helpful definition of what it is to be to do wrong that I have ever heard. And if you think about that in terms of yourself and those around you, you can have a, a just a seismic change in your whole ethical outlook. And you begin to understand the place that you actually uh, occupy in the world because the, the contrapositive of that is uh, goodness is encouragement of the right to thrive. And mm-hmm. you begin to think, how can I help him? How yeah. can I help her? Not only how can I not, de- how can I avoid denying them the right to thrive, but how can I proactively find in my relationship with X a point that will enable them to thrive? And this is the kind of compassion that the Master of the Key was talking about. Extraordinary energy. There. Yeah. Extraordinary. Well, and it kind of uh, gives me perspective then on, you know, how he, disappointed he was with the United States because, unfortunately, our foreign policy is typically trying to hamper uh, other countries' abilities to thrive uh, as opposed to the opposite. Well, it is. It's it's very uh, It's very oriented toward maintaining the United States in terms of its wealth and its power. It's just like the policies of the Roman Empire were, or the British Empire were during the colonial era. It's actually more like Rome than Britain, because Britain toward the end of the colonial era became 
much more interested in in the welfare of its colonies than it had been in the early part of it. But the Roman Empire was just a frank system of looting, where they went out there and they just looted the world. Now, in the, when you know when you I'm wearing a pair of sneakers right now. I'm sure you probably are too. Those were probably made by essentially by slave labor in Bangladesh or somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, by people who are making 15 or 20 cents a day, if that, and who have to work six or seven days a week, 10, 15 hours a day. And uh, would I wish that on my worst enemy? I wear the shoes. So, you, you know, you wear the shoes, you've got to walk in them. Yeah. And we may not like it, but in fact, our country is the most expert exploiter that has ever existed on Earth. And it is very, very unwilling and very pinched when it comes to, like, foreign aid. Most people in this country hate foreign aid, even though it's 2% of our budget or something. They just hate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, They they hate the idea of, uh, like, they're willing to let Medicaid just go because who cares about the poor? I mean, not everybody, but a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people uh, in this country are very greedy and very narrow-minded. Right. You have to be open to the needs of others. Otherwise, you cannot even see your own. Yeah, it's a great perspective. I mean, just for all of our conveniences, we built this machine that, of exploitation where, uh, right, like we live off of the, the labor of uh, others. And it is sad. It's it's looking at it from that perspective, which is an important one that he gives us, uh, you know, we've got a lot to, to work on, that's for sure. Yeah, we do. It's a great, yeah, he, he gives us a very, very great, significant moral challenge. Mm-hmm. That's a moral challenge that, you know, he really lays down the gauntlet, but at the same time, he lays it down in the context of the fact that great energy can come from living a compassionate and thoughtful life much more than we realize, and that gets back to what's going to happen. If these catastrophes become general, as they very well may, our only chance of survival is to become much more helpful and cooperative and open to others and hope they do the same. Because if we, if we get into real trouble like this, environmental trouble, the only thing that's going to save the little fish and teach him to walk and breathe dry air is if he figures out how to help himself. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Yep, we are out of time, and I hope people uh, get the book. I'm sure they will, you know, and it's not like it's it's a difficult read. It's an easy read, and it's uh, very enlightening. I mean, the bang for the buck, it's very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's, a, it's the most extraordinary and energetic thing I personally have ever read, and uh, mm-hmm. I cannot recommend it enough. It's, if I did yeah. one thing in my life that was re- really worth doing, it was transcribing that guy's words, and I'm so right. glad I managed to do it. Well, I'm glad you add so much of yourself in here, because I don't think I've read anything. I've, I've read other uh, of your work that is so even communion but this is so um personal uh it's a great insight uh into you as a person um and so it's very revealing and very bold uh, it's a brave thing to write well thank you all right so it's a great talking to whitley as usual and a very interesting interview an interesting book in order to get the book you will want to go to uh, either his site, which is unknowncountry.com, and he's got a link for it there. And then the book site is motkbook.com, motkbook.com, motkbook.com. Or just go to unknowncountry.com and you will find it there. Well, thank you for listening to the show this week. It was a lot of fun and very interesting. Next week is a lot of fun and very interesting. We're going to have Nancy Talbot and Robert Vandenbroek back and of course you know uh very interesting stuff i trust nancy implicitly she's the number one science crop circle researcher she does great work and there are some uh crop circles out in holland and some other weirdness happening including the first scientific proof of of burned circles so she's going to share that with us this is an exclusive we're lucky to be able to get 
her and Robert on. Uh, Robert, of course, connecting all the way from Holland. So thanks for listening. We are out of time. Don't forget to check openminds.tv for more UFO news, and we'll talk to you next week.